I would like to say good evening, everyone, and welcome to North Country Live um, for their presentation this evening on John Brown, uh, given by Tom McGrath. As, as most of you have heard, uh, Tom started this presentation last week with the beginning of John Brown's life, and he's going to tell us how the story ends, and we're so excited to, to have him uh, presenting this topic this evening. Um, we are going to do a couple things. We're going to mute everybody during our presentation because we really want to make sure that the sound quality is as high and as good as it can be. So we're going to mute everybody. Now, what it doesn't mean is that we don't want questions. So I would ask if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat. And at the very end of the program, uh, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. So, um, but we will keep everybody muted during the presentation. Um, I would would like to turn over the presentation at this moment to Kim Erland and uh, thank Kim for joining us and acting as co-host this evening. So Kim, it's all yours. Thanks, Selena. Good evening. Um, those of you that were here last week uh, already met me. I'm the college's um, uh, diversity officer and dean of students. I'm also a member of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative that's partnering um, with the college um, on this month's series. And so um, as Selena mentioned before we got started, if you missed last week's uh, presentation from Tom, uh, a recording of last week and a recording of tonight are um, going to be available on the YouTube channel for both the Adirondack Diversity Initiative and the North Country Community College uh, channels and closed captioning is available um, on the YouTube viewing of, of the presentation. So I'm also really excited to hear what's going to happen next. So um, I look forward to, uh, to what you're going to share tonight, Tom. Take it away. Okay. Boy, the pressure's on, huh? Let's see. All right. Well, last week we talked about um, John Brown's life, his, um, his struggles financially, his inability to really have that success and support that family. Um, but there was that one theme that ran through his entire life from childhood, and that was uh, this growing hatred of the institution of slavery. So tonight we're going to focus really on one event, and it's the event that it makes him noteworthy in history. It is his um, raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, um, his subsequent trial, execution, and then his trip home. Uh, it's kind of nice because we get to dive a little bit more into Adirondack history, and I have a lot of pictures to show you guys tonight, so um, we'll, we'll move it right along. When Brown returns from Kansas in late 1856, he now turns his sights on a new plan, uh, really a grander scheme. And again, he does that crisscrossing of the Northeast, um, even up into Canada, uh, speaking engagement after speaking engagement, trying to raise support for this for this plan and he really gets a big boost um, there's a group of wealthy abolitionists six of them and they become known as the secret six who are really going to um, fund most of this plan that brown has in mind so what is this new plan brown believes that if he takes a small group of men into the south into a, a heavily populated area of slaves uh, this will encourage those local slaves basically to escape. Uh, and he sees this sort of as a snowball effect. Um, the more slaves that uh, run to his men, the more that will follow. And his, his strategy is to um, occupy rugged terrain like mountains. And he's, again, he studied history. He has seen how small groups of men can defend against larger groups uh, by using the terrain. So by 1859, Brown has decided on where he would like to strike. Um, he had had this plan for a while. Uh, he'd even shown Frederick Douglass um, this plan in the 1840s back in Springfield. But he has decided that the place to strike is Harper's Ferry, Virginia. It is now Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. So um, I want you to take a look at this picture. Uh, it's a very unique place. If you haven't been to Harper's Ferry, uh, you really should. It's, it's just stunningly beautiful, the natural landscape, the history there. Uh, because of these two rivers that come together, 
you've got the Potomac in the lower right screen and the Shenandoah coming together. Uh, it really was a great water source for early industry. So you had uh, this isolated community, but in the 19th century, uh, it was sort of like this engine house for the Industrial Revolution. Um, what was so significant about Harper's Ferry? Well, uh, there are a number of things that Brown saw on his checklist. He sees its location. And here's a modern um, map right here. You can see the, the state of West Virginia, which has been formed since then. Um, so this town is located essentially right near the border of Maryland. It's also near the border of Virginia and Western Virginia as well. So it's easily accessible. The other thing is the mountainous terrain. This is located, actually the Appalachian Trail goes right through it. So here is uh, the battleground that Brown is looking for. He's looking for that rugged terrain. And you could question whether this was a crazy idea, um, but if you look through history, um, you know, Thermopylae, the battle uh, in ancient history, if you look at more recent wars, Afghanistan, for example, um, fighting guerrilla warfare in this type of terrain can succeed. So Brown really has um, an idea that this will work. Also remember his belief in divine intervention, that he is an instrument of God. And he is um, really, uh, it's his duty to sort of wash away the sins of this guilty nation, as he would say. He has written a constitution for this new uh, nation that will be formed in the mountains. And uh, it's a provisional government. Of course, Brown will be president and commander in chief. Um, but he has a Secretary of State, Secretary of War, um, all of the other officers you would have for a general uh, government, including a House of Representatives, and these men would primarily be uh, the free slaves. So this is something Brown has fought long and hard about. In 1859, he will start to move uh, sort of the chess pieces to set up execution of this plan. He will move into a farmhouse in Southern Maryland known as the Kennedy Farm. And he's going to take on an alias, Isaac Smith. Uh, that's the reason he grew that beard uh, as a disguise. And he will spend several months down there um, trying to gather recruits, sort of waiting for that wave of people to come and join him. Uh, it never really happens. So by October, he has about uh, 20 men with him. Um, including five free blacks. And on the night of October 16th, um, Brown will tell his men uh, that tonight is the night and they will go into action. There was also something else about Harper's Ferry that makes it uh, strategically important. It's the home of a federal arsenal that made weapons. Uh, there was probably 100,000 muskets in Harper's Ferry at that time. Brown has also ordered about 1,000 pikes to be made and shipped down to the Kennedy farm these are for slaves who would not know how to operate a musket, for example. So the men start moving down. And if you look at this map here, you'll see uh, the Harpers Ferry Road. Uh, they would start moving in this direction. They would reach Harpers Ferry uh, well into the night. And they will cross a railroad bridge. And the first part of the operation goes smoothly. They, they managed to cut the telegraph line, so no messages can be sent out of Harper's Ferry. They capture the federal arsenal. Uh, here's another shot of it. You can see the railroad bridge that crossed. That's how Brown, Brown made his entrance. He came in from the left down uh, what is known as Maryland Heights. And if you look uh, right along the shoreline of the Potomac, you'll see a group of buildings. That is the federal arsenal. That is uh, Brown's target. Better picture coming up here. Uh, taken looking down the center of it. So a lot of the manufacturing was done on the right. You can see the large chimney on the right as well. Believe it or not, uh, this is a U.S. arsenal. And on October 16th, 1859, it was guarded by one watchman. So they just simply walk in, they capture the arsenal, no problem. Um, so things are going well. Shortly after midnight, however, uh, a train comes rumbling into Harpers Ferry and stops. Brown and his men uh, move out toward the train. Uh, they fire some shots. And ironically, the first man that was hit in this crossfire 
was uh, a man that worked for the railroad. He was a baggage porter named Hayward Shepard, and he was a free black man. Uh, he would die a slow and painful death over the next couple of days. Brown makes a, a major mistake at this point, and it still really can't be explained. Um, he will let the train pass on uh, rather than keeping it Harper's Ferry. And of course, once that train reaches the next stop, conductor starts telegraphing down the wire to Baltimore, uh, Harper's Ferry, there is an insurrection. That message instantaneously will go to Washington. President Buchanan is informed early on the morning of October 17th, and the message is then sent to Governor Henry Wise of Virginia. So Brown, for Brown at this point, the clock is ticking. And what he's hoping will happen is that word will get out that um, Brown has sort of instigated, and this, this has been called an insurrection. It, it really wasn't an insurrection. It was sort of a mass liberation movement. And he's hoping he will start to see this influx of fugitive slaves uh, start to come and join him. That never happens. What does happen is the local workers, uh, townspeople, militia begin to assemble around the federal arsenal. They start firing and um, a real battle breaks out. And again, the first man of Brown's crew that is killed is a man named J Dangerfield Newby. He's a free black man who still has a wife and children in bondage, and he had joined Brown with the hope that he could go down, um, liberate them, and he will die. His body will be grabbed by the local townspeople, mutilated, and they will cut his ears off for souvenirs. So there's real, there's real anger here uh, starting to build up. I want you to look at this photograph here. This is taken, um, again, right down the center of the arsenal. If you look to the left, you will see a building with two arched doors. Uh, it looks like a firehouse because it was a firehouse. It's, a, it's the engine house for the federal arsenal. And Brown will grab his men and barricade themselves uh, into this uh, really relatively small building. So now Brown is trapped. The railroad bridge has been sealed off. That's his only route of escape. And uh, for the next day and a half, uh, Brown will be uh, trapped in this, engaged in the firefight. By the morning of the 18th, federal troops are called in under uh, Colonel Robert E. Lee, who was now commanding in the Union Army. And they will call on Brown to surrender. He refuses. And the Marines under Israel Green will uh, storm the engine house, smash down the front door and capture Brown. Now there's something important here that doesn't seem very significant. And it's one of those little things in history that, that things sometimes hinge on. When Brown is captured, he is in the process of uh, loading his revolver, but he thinks basically um, that the men will just be taken. Um, but Israel Green, will pull out his sword and try to run John Brown through. Now the sword hits Brown's belt buckle and it sort of bends up. Uh, Green had put on not his combat sword, but uh, his dress sword, which basically you'd wear to like balls and parades and things like that. Um, that is going to play a significant role in history, believe it or not. So Brown's men are rounded up, uh, captured very easily and they are sent to the local jailhouse in Charlestown, Virginia, uh, now West Virginia. Brown will be charged with three um, counts, uh, treason, murder, and fomenting a slave insurrection. The trial will begin on October 27th, and by October 31st, Brown has been convicted on all three counts. On November 2nd, he will receive his sentence, which is death by hanging. So we have this failed attempt to start this slave uprising, call it what you will. However, this event is still going to play a major role. And here is where the modern media comes in. Uh, this is very much the modern age of um, news. Newspapers are, it always been um, very prevalent in the United States, even during colonial days. But now you have steam printing presses, excuse me, steam printing presses in the telegraph. So news can not only be transmitted quickly, but newspapers can be uh, generated by the thousands. And 
I'm sure most of you here remember the O.J. Simpson trial. This was the O.J. Simpson trial of uh, the 1850s until um, uh, Lizzie Borden came along and that sort of became the new O.J. trial for that, that time period. But uh, people were reading about this. And when Brown is sentenced on November 2nd, there was a Virginia law that stated if a man was sentenced to be executed, they had to wait a month. Now, reporters were not allowed to speak to the defendant during the trial. However, in this month period, Brown is using this time to write letters. He's doing interviews with um, every newspaper possible. And he's actually in rough shape. This is a, a depiction of the trial. And if you can see sort of in the lower left, there's a man, it's like he's sleeping. Uh, that, that's John Brown. He had been beaten about the head when he was captured and uh, he was still suffering from wounds during the trial. So during much of it, uh, he, he was brought in on a cot. But remember that sword that did not run uh, John Brown through. This allows John Brown to have a voice and explain what he was trying to do. So he has four weeks to get that message out. And what does this do? This again, heightens these tensions that had been sort of growing. I talked about that last week between North and South, anti and pro-slavery. And it once again raises that issue of slavery into the forefront. Uh, this is the last sentence, uh, excuse me, uh, the last speech that Brown gave when he was um, convicted. And this, this, it's a long speech, it's well worth reading, uh, but this is what he has to say in the courtroom. I say I am yet too young to understand that God as any respecter of persons I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted I have done in behalf of his despised poor was not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit, so let it be done. So Brown has stated um, his purpose, and again, he's raising that issue. Not only that, back at the Kennedy Farmhouse in Maryland, where he had uh, holed up for several months, he brought all of his correspondence with notable figures throughout the North, and he left that so they would be found implicating those people. Brown probably knew in maybe in the back of his head that this plan may not work as he set it up. However, he probably also knew there would be a plan B. And if plan A failed, plan B would work. And that was making slavery a national crisis, uh, showing uh, how tenuous its existence was uh, in America. If a small group like this could come this close to inciting a slave insurrection, it's going to sort of escalate those tensions. Uh, most Southerners, were convinced that this was a widespread Northern conspiracy. Um, and it was not, it was a small group, uh, relatively speaking. And again, these tensions begin to grow. So John Brown did not start the Civil War, but he sort of uh, threw gasoline on the fire at that point, uh, and it wouldn't be long. On December 2nd, John Brown is set to be executed. And his behavior that day is, is very interesting. Um, one a man wrote that he stepped from the prison door, his face serene and radiant. He rode in a wagon sitting on his own coffin. And while he's riding the several blocks to this uh, open field where gallows had been erected, uh, he's chatting with uh, his guards. And he's, he's talking about how beautiful the country is. And uh, one of the things that he um, was disappointed in is that this is going to be a military ex execution. Uh, right from the point that Brown was arrested, uh, there were troops surrounding Charlestown, all of the approaches to it, uh, because they feared that something might happen. And this execution is going to be solely attended by soldiers. Upon reaching the gallows, Again, an eyewitness with that, with what elastic step he ascended the scaffold and with what dignity, composure, self-poise and indescribable grandeur he exhibited in his last moments on earth. Uh, I think 
one of the last letters that Brown writes explains why he's acting this way. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but he said that God had taken away his sword of steel and put into his hands a sword of the spirit. So he knows that he's failed in this, uh, this insurrection attempt, but he knows that this is going to go further. He makes no final speech on the gallows. The noose is put around his head uh, in its quick work. Well, this was a, a really cool postcard I found. This is probably from the turn of the century. And if you can see the caption, it says a home of John T. Gibson where the scaffold stood from which John Brown was executed. And if you look uh, lower screen, you'll see a, a yellow uh, plus sign and that's where the scaffold stood. Today, there, there's a, a plaque, a historic marker right next to it, uh, staying where it was. So as we know, John Brown's final home, uh, even though there was a lot of times he was away from it was in North Elba. He had come up to help out with the uh, community of Timbuktu. And he had written that he wanted to be buried there. And um, his wife, Mary, will come down and take his remains and make that long journey back north. Now, I hope you can see this. I made this map. Um, this is a sort of a, a 19th century depiction of what Essex County looked like in the region. And if you can see, it go, kind of goes backwards to the left. Um, if you can see where the letter A is on the shoreline, this is uh, Barber's Point in Westport. This is where Brown and uh, his cortege would be ferried across. They would make their way to Westport, letter B, and then over to Elizabethtown where they would spend the night. From Elizabethtown, they made their way to Keene. And then the last leg of the journey was to North Alba. So we're gonna follow Brown right now, uh, literally in his footsteps. And we're gonna see some photographs and um, see what's left, uh, what, what uh, Mrs. Brown would have seen and we're, what Brown would have seen in life too. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, Brown was very familiar with this road. So as I said, Mary Brown is going to accompany her husband home and Brown, Brown the control freak Brown, um, he literally wrote out the route that she was to take on her way home. And I know a lot of this was probably for people that were sympathetic to him, but uh, there was one very strange thing. She, he told her that when you're in Virgins, the fish is very good. So make sure you eat the fish. Uh, I don't know, it's lost to history whether or not she did that. But again, Brown's, you know, his personality, he wanted to make sure that everything went his way. So here's the photograph looking across the lake. This, this was taken in June. So you need to take uh, all of these leaves off the trees. Uh, it's a dismal day in December, uh, December 6th, when Brown is going to be, uh, his, his corpse is going to be ferried across and he will land at Barber's Point. So uh, this, land is actually still owned by the Barber family. It's a campground now uh, and they were really nice. They let me in on private property to see where the landing site was. So I was able to take these photographs here. So this is what it would have looked like on December 6th as um, Mary Brown and John come back into the Adirondacks. They will pass this schoolhouse which is on the old road leading from Barber's Point to downtown Westport. This uh, schoolhouse still stands. It was built in 1816, and um, it's the oldest courthouse in Essex County. And I like this photograph because you can see looming up in the background uh, their destination. They're headed back into the Adirondacks behind. When you go to Westport, right in the center of town, there is a, a beautiful green and a library. This was the site of the Persons Hotel where Mary Brown stopped and had lunch. And this uh, hotel unfortunately burned in the 1870s and this green area was left um, sort of as a public area and they built the library behind it. But a reporter on the scene when they arrived in Westport said the house was soon uh, filled with the leading residents of the town, eager to learn all the particulars of the execution. They found it hard to realize that their old friend and fellow citizen, the man whom they had known so well 
and only known to respect and admire had actually been put to death. Uh, a local historian, Carlin Walker, wrote, through the years, Brown had been a frequent visitor in both Elizabethtown and Westport, and those who knew Brown liked and respected him, and said he was an eccentric but dedicated believer in freedom for all, not a fiery-eyed fanatic, as he was too often depicted. So you, you read these accounts, and it sounds like Brown was really um, well-liked, and I, and I think that speaks to that other side of his personality. I think he was very good at, at communicating. Uh, in, in really getting his message across. From Westport, they will start to make their way up the Northwest Bay Road. Now this is uh, Route 73, I believe, but this road is the first major road into the heart, heart of the Adirondacks. Uh, it was finished in 1810, and it, it allows for the settlement of places like Elizabethtown and Lake Placid, North Elba. But, this is going to be a rough trip for Mary and the group carrying John Brown's corpse. About six o'clock in the evening, they start to make their way into Elizabethtown uh, in a dreadful storm of wind and rain. They would have passed uh, this beautiful building here, the Hand House, as they came into Elizabethtown. They would have um, taken a left and made their way up and stopped in front of the Elizabeth Court, Elizabethtown Courthouse. Now this is where John Brown will be um, stored for the night and six local people, including one of the hand uh, boys would guard John Brown overnight. And there's a plaque commemorating that you can go. So you can see there's an old picture of the courthouse on the left and this is what it looks like today. So for the most part, it, it looks very similar, but if you look closely, you'll see there was a a double stairway that led up to the second floor. That's where the uh, actual courtroom was. So there have been some modifications here. And if you're really a loser like me, you can go up closely and look at the brick and you can see where it's been filled in, uh, where the original door was, um, which I did last week. So, but this is a sort of become a spot of pilgrimage. In the last several weeks, there have been several rallies and protests outside on the grounds all because of that John Brown connection. Now, Mrs. Brown and the group, uh, which included Wendell Phillips, by the way, would stay across the street in the Deer's Head Inn. This, this building was built, I believe, about 1830, and then moved, I think, to this spot in the 1840s. And it was part of a larger, excuse me, a larger complex. And to the right, uh, the, what was called the Mansion House, which was sort of this much uh, bigger section of the hotel, uh, was raised to make room for this um, this little mall here. The next morning, the group resumes their journey. One reporter said, the roads were so bad as to be almost impassable. They would reach the town of Keene about 10 o'clock. So it probably took them four to five hours to go from Elizabethtown to Keene. So if you've driven that route, uh, that's a long time to make that. So this is definitely a, a tough trip. They stopped in Keene and had lunch with another old Brown friend. And here again, there were people to welcome them and give sympathy to Mrs. Brown. The next leg of the journey was the toughest. If you travel out of Keene, uh, you will reach Alstead Hill Road. And uh, if you veer to the right, that's the old Northwest Bay Road. And they would have passed this beautiful farmhouse. I'm not sure if this actual building stood there at the time. It looks like it might be old enough. But at this point, the road ends. And today, it has been condemned and turned into a hiking trail. So you can actually walk this road. And um, the owner of that house, I spoke to him last week, and he made a good point that John Brown used to walk this road. So we are following his 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 death, his funeral procession, so to speak, but this was Brown in life as well. Today, Mountain Lane is where the old Northwest Road comes back in and connects with the main road as well. And there's a very, here's, here's what it looks like from uh, the junction. There's a very interesting spot that a lot of people miss. This was the site where John Brown lived for the first year and a half while his land was being cleared. 
And there was a lot of stories about Brown in this house uh, that people would come by and visit. So if you're moving your way towards uh, North Alba on 73, look closely for the sign. Uh, you can see it. John Brown occupied a house on this site in 1848 to 50 while clearing the land known as John Brown's farm. So this is, it's all overgrown now. I almost got run over taking these pictures. So if you do stop, be careful. Um, people really fly by. Today, there is a sign that shows where uh, John Brown's grave is. This is um, the road to uh, the Brown farm, obviously. And finally, after an exhausting journey, they arrive after dark and uh, there's a, an emotional reunion with Mary Brown and her, her uh, children. Uh, some of the extended family and neighbors were there as well. And they finally made it home. It was a very cold moonlit night. So they, uh, Mrs. Brown orders the corpse to be brought upstairs. And she's afraid that after this long trip and to be kind of graphic, all the banging around that uh, there might be some damage to the corpse. And uh, upon inspection, he looks good because they plan to have um, a, a viewing for the funeral. The funeral will take place in the farmhouse. And Lyman Epps Sr. and Jr., two members of Timbuktu, uh, free black citizens, would sing John Brown's favorite song, the one he liked to sing to his children, uh, Blow Ye, Ye Trumpet Blow. Uh, number of people came across the lake from Vermont in early December to attend. Wendell Phillips gave an eloquent eulogy praising Brown's heroic and noble efforts. After the ceremony inside, it was carried out to this table, and this is where the final viewing took place. By the way, the, um, the person that was recording these images was Thomas Nast, who in the 1870s gave us the modern version of Santa Claus. So he was a German immigrant, and um, for newspapers which couldn't reproduce photographs in this time period, they would send out artists to um, capture the scene. Uh, so here we have Brown laid out for his final viewing. Following that, there was a procession, short distance. You can actually see the table and the house in the background. Uh, the ground was frozen and it took um, a few of the neighborhood boys a long time to dig that grave six feet down, but they were able to do it. And there was a final blessing and Brown was lowered into the grave. Brown had chosen this spot specifically if you visit today, and we'll see photographs in just a minute, there is a massive boulder next to it, which has his name etched uh, in it as well. It's become sort of a family plot. The grave soon becomes a, uh, a place of pilgrimage and just curiosity seekers, uh, tourists. This uh, photograph taken probably about the 1880s, 1890s or so. Now, this next photograph to this one, uh, has never ever been seen before. I purchased an old scrapbook um, of a family in Vermont. And as I was flipping through it, there was this picture, John Brown's grave taken probably about 1910, 1915. You can see it's got this uh, protection around the stone. Uh, there's a large boulder in the background. And even more amazing is this is how they got there. Um, over that treacherous road uh, all the way from Vermont. So uh, today you can see that boulder and the farm site in the background. This has been uh, open to the public. Uh, even if the museum isn't open, uh, it's a great place to go and walk around and, and tour the grounds. And uh, when you think about it, this is probably one of the most important graves, most famous graves in history because of the Civil War songs, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. So to wrap things up, I just want to conclude with this. Uh, let's go back to December 2nd of 1859, the day of execution. I said that John Brown did not give any speech from the gallows. However, that morning, he did slip a note to his jailer and he wanted this to be published. And it read in part, I, John Brown, 
I'm now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. Just one year later, South Carolina secedes from the Union, uh, and this sort of um, starts this rapid decline into civil war. And John Brown was absolutely right. Uh, over 620,000 dead, um, which would ultimately eliminate slavery, which was Brown's goal all along. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tom. Yes, if anyone has questions, please type them into the chat and we will um, answer as many as we can this evening. I did want to go back to one picture um, right here. <laughs> the first time I visited this, I, was, I just thought it was funny, the juxtaposition of Brown's farm and then ski jumps in the background. You can see the giant tower, but it's just another illustration of those layers of history that you see uh, when you look at a spot and you see how sort of it's been used and interpreted in different ways, but. That is interesting, Tom. Um, we have one question so far. Um, do you know if there's a historic map of the Underground Railroad in the area, from the area? Um, there's been a lot of research done into that and there's a museum uh, which is located in Essex County. I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but you could easily find it. They're probably the best source. Um, the Adirondack History Museum as well um, have a number of guidebooks. Um, as far as maps, one thing to keep in mind is that these were um, secret routes, so they wouldn't have documented them back then. So a lot of it is conjecture. Sometimes it's literally, oh, my house has this weird hole in the wall that, you know, I don't know what purpose it serves. So you can kind of link the dots or you know things are passed down um, through oral history. But I think there's gonna be more that comes to light as we kind of examine this, this further. I've heard that there was no Underground Railroad activity you know, up in Brown's area and that's, that's just not true. So it's a matter of just uncovering the sources. Okay. And do you know um, if any of Brown's sons died at Harper's Ferry? There were two. Um, there was one that was sent out with um, not a flag of truce, but a flag uh, to sort of negotiate. Uh, and he was shot down. Another of his sons, Oliver, was shot and he would die as well. well they were buried in Harper's Ferry and they would actually be um, disinterred and brought back to North Elba. Uh, and I think actually one of his sons, his body was donated to science and uh, there was like, he was used as a teaching tool. There's, there's some, a lot of weird history connected with it. That engine house that um, I sh we showed a picture of earlier, uh, that was dismantled brick by brick and it was like toured around the country. You, you can find lots of cool pictures online. They would rebuild it. It was at, like at the Chicago World's Fair uh, and then it was brought back to um, a, a college that sits in Harpers Ferry on top of the hill. It's made its way back literally to probably 50, 50 feet of where it originally stood. But um, that where it stood has been built up by dirt for a railroad track. So they would have to dig down, but that railroad track is no longer used. So it would be great if someday they could dig that out and move it across the street and put it where it was, but. Yeah, interesting. Anyone else have any questions for Tom tonight? And in case you missed it, or just as a reminder, um, when Marissa sent out the email um, for tonight's uh, program, there is a survey link in that email that we'd really appreciate your feedback and comments. Um, we're uh, working hard to keep this momentum going and continue to provide uh, content uh, virtually uh, this fall and we'll have more information very soon, but it, it helps us to evaluate what we've done this summer if you could complete that survey. Thank you everyone for you know, tuning in. This is a lot of fun. We really appreciate yeah. it. One final question, Tom. Uh, do you know if there are any living descendants of John Brown? That I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I would I would tend to say yes, but not sure on that one. No problem. 
All right, I'll turn it back over to Selena for some closing remarks. Thanks for being here tonight, everyone. Yes, thank you, Tom. That was amazing. I tell you, I'm starting to really enjoy history. Uh, thank you so much for, for that. It was just really, really great. And I hope everyone um, in, in our audience enjoyed tonight as well. I just want to say a big thank you to our North Country Community College Foundation for helping to sponsor our series. Also, the enrollment team who, who has helped at, at every uh, part of this presentation series, and especially Marissa for helping all of us get on Zoom in a timely fashion. Thank you so much. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for spending your time with us on a Thursday evening. We hope you have enjoyed and we hope you will continue to enjoy some of our presentations. We're working now on a fall presentation, um, so, so we'll keep you apprised of that as we, as we plan for that. We do have one other, our very last uh, presentation in the summer series coming next Thursday, and that is going to be by Pete Nelson, who is going to talk about place names in the Adirondacks, a diverse past. So please consider joining us. Um, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, and you can find us at North Country Live. Thank you everyone and have a great evening.